Hey, it's, it's me again. At the end of this talk, you'll officially know everything I know about anything, um, uh, which I, uh, <laughs> I, I'll try to, so I'll have to make it seem a little more complicated than it really is. So, you know, well, I, I was talking about, you know, when I hear this previous talk, I always think it's, I am really lucky to be working in science and technology now, uh, because I do have the possibility of thinking about uh, using the, the greatest of processing power and computer speed and nanotechnology and materials to do everything from new organs, uh, new internal organs and body parts, to talking about something that I've loved, of course, since I was a child, who doesn't? Space. Um, and some of the challenges that space travel will entail in the future and how maybe nanotechnology and some of the things we're doing and dreaming about in our labs and in our classes can be used. So we're going to talk about just two areas of this. I mean, with these, these all things need to be solved before you can do long voyages, such as trips to Mars and, uh, uh, and, and long, e extensive space travel. But these are the two that we'll talk about, and maybe a little bit about propulsion, but not so much. And this was all sparked two years ago. I, I read uh, a friend, Lawrence Krauss, um, uh, who's a, a physicist, had this, this quote in the New York Times that says, well, you know, space travel to Mars is not very practical, he felt. And it sparked this long debate that you may remember about whether if you do a trip to Mars, whether it can only be a one-way trip, <laughs> that you wouldn't be able to get back. And he said the reason was inter inter space radiation and that there wasn't shielding necessary. So let's see, is Dr. Krauss right? So what can make this? Are, are all of these things into what, what is possible? This last thing was actually the International Space Station. Well, you may think that this is all I think about, but here we go with nanotechnology and polymer technology. <laughs> so silicone, which you know the wonders of now, and some other types of nanomaterials, and you'll find that these have some things in common that can make this possible. So we talk about two forms of science here. Nanotechnology, which is the study of everything that is small in the nanoscale. So from a billionth to about a hundred millionth of a meter. And a field that you may not have heard of, which is rheology. And with the combination of knowing these two things, you can actually uh, start to solve some of these problems that Dr. Krauss feels unsolvable. And what rheology is, is the study of, you know, comes from the Greek rheos, which means to flow. So how do materials flow in this case? So one study of rheology would be just how water would flow from it, it, into a beaker. Now if you have a force, a capillary force, and you measured that force, that's also a rheological behavior. So we want to measure force deformation in time. So that's the study of rheology. And if, formally, that's what I am as a polymer rheologist. So I study how these materials both behave when they're forming and then once they're in a real world setting. So in the case of silicon, we go back to silicone, we go back to a very old idea, which Charles Goodyear discovered 150 years ago, which is the idea of vulcanization. And that, that way, we, we are dealing with something that is elastic and is viscous. So it behaves like a liquid at times, and it behaves like an elastomer at times. So this be, becomes very useful. Just a little I illustration of taking that flow and linking that flow together. So for years, before you had this type of resolution, you know, they, you know, it was modeled what, what polymers looked like when they were entangled. And it was called the spaghetti bowl model. And it turns out when you actually start getting nanometer resolution, we see that polymers are just entangled particles like this. I'm going to skip through some of the, uh, the uh, theory. The basic idea is that everything, if you were looking at a pure spring, and you pull the spring and you release the spring, it would go back to what this was at rest. But when something is viscoelastic, it, there is a remaining uh, element to it. So it's a combination of both a viscous and an elastic behavior. So we know that. I, makes me think that polymers provide an interesting solution for creating a new spacesuit. 
but not just any polymer. You know, it, I, I was even talking to somebody recently who was saying that they had worked at NASA 10 years ago and that they were working on a, like a spandex type spacesuit. Um, and I said, well, you know, good idea, but what we really need is something that is viscoelastic and that doesn't, doesn't curl up or bunch up. So how can we use elastomers in a practical way? Now, alone, silicon, silicone will rip. It will, you know, it, it won't stand up also to some of the radiation that you're dealing with in deep space. So you also need a combination of fillers. And these are, are nanofillers. So we call these, when you put them together, a complex polymer system. Not so creative, but we need one that is flexible and that, ha that can act as both a plastic and a metal, but that can be processed in a way that makes them behave both as a liquid and a solid. So is this possible? Okay, think about what spacesuits usually look like. If spacesuits are inherently bulky and difficult to move in, I have no idea how an astronaut can screw in something on, a space st on the space station with one of these suits. But they build in a, an atmosphere by vacuum. Uh, the pressure in space, you need to keep a constant pressure. So you can keep that pressure in several ways. The way it's always been done is like this. So you basically have two air supplies. You have an air supply for breathing and an air supply to keep this pressure. But the problems with that are spacesuits are bulky. They're inflexible. And they can only be worn for a limited time due to the air supply. So it, it, this is what you know, people dreamed of, having this sort of tight spacesuit where you're, you're getting the pressure not from air, but pressure just from tightness. The problem with this is it needs to be completely skin tight. Well, what, I didn't, what is starting to be realized is that astronauts lose weight very quickly at the, when they're traveling in space. So if there's any wrinkle from where they used to be fat, uh, then, that, then you are not protected in those areas. So whatever spacesuit you created on Earth before you go up would not work after a very short amount of time in space. So you can't really have something form-fitting. And it's difficult to get dressed for a spacewalk in something so tight. So, what this is, so I, by the way, this is all conceptual and some things w w I've talked with some, with some of the space companies that are working on space tourism ideas. Is that you take a textile made of carbon nanofibers. These are just, they're extremely strong. They have good reflective qualities. They have good electrical properties so that you can run cooling systems through them. And you put them on your body like a glove, kind of a, a, a fairly loose glove that every time you can zip into, you can step into, very easy to get in and out of. And it's lightweight, it's flexible. And then you take a liquid polymer coating. So uh, we actually have some intellectual property on this. It's a, it, it becomes like a, silic a silicone bath or a silicone shower that you can put on in uh, every time you go for a spacewalk. And it's completely transparent. And it, it was first the, the, tested with uh, nan nanometer size. Uh, but it prevents bubbles from building up. It, it's co cohesive. And so you have a ready-made spacesuit every time you go out into space. Since you're in this mesh also, this carbon mesh, that there's one problem you have in space also that Lawrence Krauss mentioned, which is micro tears that you get from micro collisions in space. This, this kind of polymer is really interesting because if you, between those pieces of carbon mesh, if there's a tear at all, it's self-healing and it's cured by UV, which there's an excess of in space. So every, every, little tears don't propagate because of this and they're self-healing. Uh, so you get a ready-made, Cure with UV spacesuit that's completely form fitting. So we'll see. <laughs> that's all. <laughs>